This podcast is sponsored by Ingrock. Ingrock is the premier delivery platform for apps, APIs, and IoT devices for millions of users today. It provides the ability for developers to easily deploy their code by collapsing the complexity of the CDN, WAF, API gateway, and global network load balancing into a single SaaS service, while allowing CISOs and network operations teams to standardize their networking controls, auditing, and observability configuration for all network ingress in one place. If you are building a product that needs access to data, systems, APIs, or devices stuck behind a network firewall, check out ingrock.com today. And now, on to our show. Can I get the icon in cornflower Hey everybody, welcome to episode 27 of Can I Get That Software in Blue? I'm one of your hosts, Chad Tindall. Along with me is my co-host, the Kaiser of Kindness, the Emperor of Empathy, Steve Mazak, everybody. Thanks, Chad. <laughs> Great to be here once again. You got some new nicknames going on. I know, I like it. Well, you're working at Empathic. I, I like that Emperor of Empathy. It's got some plosives. Cool nicknames it's... like that. Hey, you never know. Chad's got this bag of tricks that he holds along the side. I think he was a rapper in a former life, potentially. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. It's my calling, but I just haven't made it there yet. <laughs> We're also joined today by a special guest from Mark Logic to MongoDB. His journey's been sound. Now as Confluence Field CTO, his insights abound. Will the Forest, everybody. Right on. Thanks for joining us, Will. I'm excited to have you here. Yeah, this is our Field CTO episode. I recently accepted a position as a Field CTO at Ingrock and been doing that for the last month or so. Will is the current Field CTO. At Confluence, Steve is the former CTO at Elastic, I'm sorry, he's a field CTO at Elastic. And so we're going to be talking about that role and kind of what that role does at different companies. And every company does it a little bit different. So we're here to find out from Will what he does at Confluent in, in that role. Sounds good. Well, Will, should we start by talking about kind of your journey at Confluent, like, and just educate folks on what Confluent does? I know a lot of our followers probably know, but it's good to just kind of refresh and then We'd love to talk about kind of what are the industry trends that you're seeing as it relates to Confluent and the orbit around you guys. Yeah, sure. Well, as as Chad alluded to, my my background's really been one centered around data. That's always what I've loved way back when it wasn't hip, right? And no, no, no. data data has always been hip. What do you? I don't know. What I, I'm about. not sure about that. Well, I'm I'm older than you are, I think. So you know, I I had a brief stopover at Red Hat which was a great company culturally. And Chad, I know you were there as well, but like yep. that was what really crystallized the fact to me of, of a couple of things that I really, it was about the data for me, right? So I was like, great company, but just wasn't a fit for me and what I like to talk about and what I want to do. And the other thing is during that period, I was talking to a lot of customers who were just starting to use Kafka. And at the time for me anyways, it's like, okay, yeah, Kafka, whatever. It's a great pipe to get data to some sort of data store. That's that's my mental model. And I think yeah. in those early years, that's what mostly people thought about. Like, oh, I'm going to use it to get data into Hadoop. Just yet another messaging bus. Honestly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it was a pipe. And don't get me wrong, people still use it as a pipe. But that's when a former colleague of mine from MongoDB reached out. He was at Confluent in the early days. He convinced me to talk to the... CEO, which was Jay. And I talked to some of the investors and I started to understand the bigger picture of, of really what it enabled, not just a dumb pipe, but you know, this notion of real time event driven architectures uh, and how that can change the way in which you, you build anything. Right. I took the job. I actually, my journey has been spanned a lot of different things because when I was at Mongo, actually I was a sales leader as Chad, you may remember. But, you know, traditionally I was an engineer, same thing when I joined Confluent, I came in on the sales side because one of the things, and I think we're going to get to this when we all talk about the field engineer, field CTO role is as much as I love coding and doing technical things, I actually love talking to lots of customers. I just think it's, it's a blast. It's yeah, a that's, lot of that's fun. That's my passion too, for sure. Right. You know what I mean? Hearing it's like every week. part of the job. Yeah. You hear a new problem, a new challenge, something new, cool that they're doing. You're like, wow, that's awesome. But ultimately my roots in technology, you know, I had, a, I had a good run, but I just, I love the technical side and a couple good years at Confluence, we grew rapidly and I decided to move back to the technology side and they said, Hey, Will, why don't you 
take on the role of a field CTO, which at the time was just public sector for me because I, I live in the DC area. So I was like public sector field CTO. And that was the first field CTO we had at Confluent. But now it's, you know, it's, it's changed now I'm for the Americas and we actually currently have three field CTOs. So that's my really long winded, boring answer to my journey. Let me, let me ask you, what was it that made Kafka blow up so big, given that, you know, we've had MQ and all these various other messaging brokers for decades. What was it about Kafka that people just loved so much? Yeah, it's kind of bizarre because seemingly when you talk about it, it's a really simple technology. It's just a mutable append only commit log that happens to be exposed using a pub sub metaphor. And so like, if you're coming from the messaging world, you say, oh yeah, this is just like a clustered, highly resilient, scalable messaging. If you're coming from the database side, you're like, okay, this is, this is a highly performant. It's got some characteristics of a database, right? Cause it's highly performant. Cause you're not doing all that indexing work that you typically do. If you have to maintain B trees or inverted indexes, all that stuff. Right. The access patterns are very similar still. Yeah. 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 But you're ingesting data. So if you're coming from those two angles, you kind of view it a little bit differently, but I, I do fundamentally think that the big thing that changed it was that rather than traditional messaging, which was still like, typically you had a queue and that queue was as big as it could live on a machine. And there's only so much concurrency and throughput you can have on a single machine. And then the patterns became really complicated when you wanted to do pub sub, because you had to have separate queues for different consumers. The fact that you just had this simplistic way of having a centralized cluster that decoupled the data producers from the consumers and could scale massively, I think is what changed the game in terms of what you could do with PubSub. Because now, of course, I can persist data for many days and I can do it at a high volume. And if I want to, once I read a message, it's not gone. I rewind and reprocess it. Or if there's new consumers that I didn't even know was going to exist, like some new project comes along and say, oh, by the way, I'd really like to tap into that data. I can get that stream. I'm just going to go to the topic, start at the beginning and read it, right? That was a very powerful change from traditional messaging. It's one of the reasons, and I'm sure we'll get into this later. It's one of the reasons why we're seeing it so much now when people talk about data mesh and data products. So that, that sort of difference. Well, so did it share this characteristics that MongoDB had in the sense that it was it was easy to scale massively, but simultaneously really easy to develop against? Actually, not quite as easy to develop. One of the things that MongoDB got really, really well was just how easy they made it for developers to use. Right. To me, that was the secret sauce. I mean, let's be honest, the early days of MongoDB, it was pretty mediocre technology, if I'm gonna be honest. The underlying, the way it indexed, the way it stored. When MongoDB acquired Wired Tiger, then it became a lot better. They just incrementally improved it. Now it's awesome. But what made it work really, really well was how easy it was to use. I would say actually Kafka, at least Confluence ambition, of course, is to make it easy to use. But I, I don't think still changing to this asynchronous event-driven architecture is a bigger paradigm shift than moving from a relational database to a document-oriented database right? It, it actually is, can be kind of challenging for people. So I don't think ease of use is really what did it. I think just unlocking use cases that otherwise you couldn't achieve with traditional messaging was sort of what did it. But yes, MongoDB, it scales horizontally and can support massive scale. I think the other thing was the rise of other technologies that leveraged Kafka in their architecture, right? Elastic, I think is a really good example of that. I think what Pivotal was doing around microservices and trying to create 12 factor apps and all that stuff or whatever it was, those also helped because in their architecture, they were the event driven stateless architectures that needed something Kafka. So it's this, <laughs> for lack of a better word, confluence of events that kind of all made each other successful and built on each other. Cause I, I can't tell you how many times at Elastic we ran into confluent as the messaging broker for data, for the data pipeline. Oh, and it all made over sense. the place. Yeah. yeah, well, like you were saying, it made it really interesting because the idea that we could replay data from two days ago from Kafka meant that we could experiment and people could experiment more with the data. Like, I'm going to index it this way. Okay, well, that didn't exactly work. Now I'm going to index it that way. Yep. Yeah. Well, and then I think the other thing is just, you know, because to this day, we have tons and tons of projects specifically with Elastic. It's a great combination. But the other thing it does is because it's such a simple way of ingesting data, 
Kafka in systems is almost never the bottleneck because it does so little. It's, yeah. it's, it's literally just doing sequential writes and it buffers it and it can store it. So if you have something like Elastic or MongoDB or anything downstream that has to do something complex with it, well, then you're going to be affected much more by peaks and valleys. And so it became this really nice, you know, this sort of buffer to put in front of these technologies like Elastic. So that's another reason why, you know, you don't have to worry about the peaks. You just index it as fast as it can and Kafka is not going to lose it, right? That's exactly right. That's a great example of how, you know, you don't have to buy more than maybe 10 nodes of something on the back end because now you can control the ingest rate a little better. I used to call it the stadium problem where people would build this massive infrastructure that's only full on Sunday. And the rest of the time it's just sitting there empty collecting dust. There's some companies that that's their conscious choice. Like I know eBay does this, they used to, I don't know if they still do, but they used to build their entire infrastructure for, it was like the second week of December or something like that, which is their busiest days. And so their infrastructure was built for that. And the rest of the time they use it for experimentation and things like that. So it's not going to waste as much, but. Right. Every, every e-commerce company has that problem. You know, Black Friday is a big day. Sales are a big day, you know. I mean, cloud computing has kind of changed that a little bit since our days, right? Just because there is more infrastructure and demand and Elastic, MongoDB, Confluent, we're all building our services in a cloud native way so that you yeah. can can expand it when you need it and, and contract when you don't need it. So that has changed. I don't think there's as many of those companies anymore that want to do that. So no, no. I mean, it's funny you say that. Well, back in the day when I was at Nike, this is like late nineties, early two thousands. We were so excited when we got 500 orders in a week on the website. And now that's probably every two seconds or something. <laughs> yeah. It's one of the reasons why I, I love the, sorry about that. I, I love the uh, Confluent has this published I know, video about Instacart's experience. And actually it's a great, so just take Confluent out of the picture, regardless. It's, it's amazing to hear what it was like for them when COVID struck. They were like, we experienced, I, I can't remember the specific numbers they cited, but we experienced 10 years of growth in two weeks or something. 3000% growth or something like that. Cause we were helping them on the elastic side as well. Cause you know, that's, that was one of the ones I remember. Cause as soon as COVID hit their usage skyrocketed. Yeah. And they were already like, this probably might not be too much inside baseball, but they were already kind of at the edge of scaling everything and like, you know, growing. And then to have COVID hit, it was just, like you said, it forced not just 10 years of scale, but 10 years of activities and reactions and hiring and all that stuff. So very compressed. Yeah, same thing as what Zoom had happened. You know, they went from yeah. a few million users to 100 million users yeah. in a couple months. It's crazy. Yeah, pretty nuts. So, Will, at Confluent, I'm sure there's other things that are coming up that are topical. What are some of the trends you're seeing in that ecosystem right now and, and data in general? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the, the, the two things that I spend most of my time talking about when I talk to CIOs, CTOs of customers is really i don't want to fixate on data mesh but really the idea of how do they become more data centric and in other words the pivot from not you know we're not a product company we're not even a digital company we need to be we need to treat data as a strategic asset so becoming really data driven it's about the data i always like to say nowadays that like if you look at that andreessen you know software's eating the worlds that was about 10 years ago yeah. And I don't think anyone would argue with that, but actually, as it turns out, writing code is easy. Like, it is like, actually like, you can go on chat GPT and I can just the other day, I said, yeah. write me an event driven architecture on Kafka that tracks buses. And guess what? It spits out a pretty good chunk of code. But even before that, it was the easy part. The hard part is how you're managing the data, right? Because you have all these different silos. And so anyways, I think every company realizes that the data that they have about their customers or the products or anything is one of the most valuable assets they have. I mean, I think the, the Googles of the Facebooks and the LinkedIn's of the world knew that, but this is the case now, even with like a real estate company. I just talked to one earlier today. We're like, yeah, we need to find a way to become data centric. That That's the thing I spent all my time talking about is like, how do you unlock the data from your in many cases, mainframes with COBOL and relational yeah. databases, and then make it available for all these downstream consumers that want it. So that's a big one. Machine learning is another one that, you know, I talk about weekly, especially everyone wants to make it about generative AI because there's so much excitement and there should be a lot of excitement about it. But you know, that's the other topic that's, that's big right now. 
how do you see Confluent fitting into like these emergent AI architectures? Yeah, I mean, so our role, I don't think our role's changed too much in terms of machine learning. I mean, we've been used, the, the poster child, I always say machine learning is like, for instance, Uber, just because they exposed, they had this, their Michelangelo platform and they exposed yeah. the internals of that pretty early. And fundamentally, most people know Uber is a very Kafka oriented event driven architecture, but the story there was like, okay, I have all this operational data, normal data. First of all, I need to pipe it into my platform where I'm building my models and inferencing, right? And so Kafka, as you pointed out, has long been used for that. I think the one thing that is changing a little bit now is that some of the there's a greater demand to make apply machine learning models in real time rather than batch. And so now the question is, how do I embed my models in, for instance, a stream processor to do that in real time? And where does it where does it make sense to do that? Because sometimes, you know, if I can run my my model in batches and it's hourly, that's good enough. But in sometimes you want to know near real time seconds, especially fraud detection is a big one. So we still have the deliver the data to get it trained. I think the thing that's changed now is just embedding models in the streams. Are the fraud models changing so frequently that they do need to be in real time? I get that you need to check against the model in real time when someone swipes a card, but updating the model, why would they need to do that? Well, the, the crazy thing about fraud is, is that fraud is a great example of something that everyone thinks they understand. Literally, there is a new kind of fraud that is being, that's, that's popping up every week. The newest thing is QR fr code fraud. Someone will go in and swap out the QR code at a restaurant. So you think you're paying the restaurant, but you're actually sending your money to someone else. Oh, that's filthy. Oh my God. That's so genius Jeez. and diabolical. If only, if only I was Russian and I had thought of that a year ago, but I have to update my family now. Thanks, Will. Yeah. <laughs> PSA here. Jeez. But I think. So A, yes, the, the way in which you detect fraud is changing quite a bit, but actually remember what I'm talking about now is the implementation of a model in real time, not the training of it in real time. There's a demand for that as well, Yeah. because like, really, if I'm a financial institution, what I want to do is say, I want to block the transactions before they happen rather than after the fact and try to figure it out. So that's where you know, injecting the models in the streams actually makes sense. Yes. Okay. I, I've seen that too. Yeah. For exactly that reason. You know, uh, this is plugging something that I'm part of, but the, some of the guys that built that Michelangelo platform went off to start a company called Tecton. I got in touch with them and became an advisor for their pre-sales team, but they hired a guy named Ryan who's great. So they're off and running, but it's just kind of cool that, you know, stuff that spins out into other companies and becomes a thing so is that what we're doing well, now um, we're talking our books i just just a little plug because will brought it up hey you're allowed to plug yeah, right yeah 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 <laughs> we can plug we can do whatever we want it's our i podcast. hear that apple stock is going through the moon right now <laughs> will so sound like warren buffett one of the things i've been looking at in my spare time is all the lang chain stuff and how to do embeddings and vector databases and things like that are you guys seeing different kind of destinations for your data in the last few years are vector databases on the rise now and you're seeing that too well i think i think that's a great point that that is another reason why i think kafka is gaining more traction is because it there's a, just a lot more data technologies out there that are being yeah. used for if i'm doing a graph analysis i want to use a graph database I, if i'm doing time series i want to use time series database in the old days you know throw everything into oracle and or, and come up with some exotic schemas kind of make something work. We saw that change. So the specialization and the data layer actually is driving Kafka usage just because like I said, it's, it's you, you publish the data one time and then you can have multiple consumers. So I can't actually speak to, to vector databases, to be honest, cause I know nothing about them, but yeah. specialized databases is a driver, I think. Do you see Confluent kind of becoming or is a database in, an, in its own right? It's kind of a staging database. I, I'm going to say emphatically no, because I'm a database person. So if anyone at Confluent, to, listen, I, I just call it how it is. Like we had a stream processing framework called KSQL. So literally it's exactly as you, you provide some C, well, we still have it. You provide some SQL and it a little processes the data as it flows through a topic in real time and you transform it. You can do projections and aggregates, but it's a stream processor. 
And we renamed it at some point K SQL DB because we wanted to support some additional capabilities and we wanted to make it a little bit easier. If you didn't need a persistent database to do it, and I was like, please, please, for God's sake, please do not call it K SQL DB. But we did. And yeah, short answer is no, we're not a database. And if anyone from Confluent tells you we're a database, they're wrong. So it, it is interesting though, because you're right, the na naming things has a lot of implications and people make a lot of assumptions. So as soon as you call it a DB, my expectations just changed. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we have some similarities. We do persist data, but I mean, we don't have indexes. We don't have, I mean, there's just so many things. But I, I do see it just continuing to reassert its value in the stack. And it seems like depending on how you decide to do these image driven architectures, there's a lot of power to be had in learning how to use things like ksql in confluent because you can do so much stuff and if you're replaying things then you can make a change and replay make a change replay and you don't have to worry about corrupting the source data it's really cool i think yeah and you also see people building these higher level things I, there's this company called materialize that right pulls a bunch of different streaming sources together you can write a sql query and it, it kind of joins across different streaming sources kafka being one of them and that's, that stuff is pretty powerful too. And it's getting bigger. All right. So we've done enough Confluent commercial. It's fun though. I love that technology. Well, you would have thought it would be, I, I mean, I would have thought it would be more commoditized by now, but it's not, it, they, they, they keep adding more value. People keep going to it. They're not replacing it with something else. You know, I don't hear a lot. I don't, I've never in a conversation where people are saying, I'm trying to get off Kafka and move to something different. It's just not happening. Especially if you're in the cloud space, if, if you want to manage service, because then quite frankly, at the end of the day, you really don't care what technology is being used behind the scenes. You have your, the SLAs, you have the capabilities we provide. And if Confluent uses carrier pigeons to send messages and we get it in time and super fast, then you don't care. It's carrier pigeons, right? So that's the other thing that's changing. Not to say we don't have plenty of on-prem customers. And like you say, we're, we're starting to focus on all the other things that you, like Kafka is great, but it's like, okay, that's a data broker. It's awesome, but you need all these other things for vendor-driven architectures. So you need data yeah. governance and lineage and streaming catalogs and data quality control and schemas and all that stuff. So. Yeah. It's kind of like, I, I view it like my house. Like I don't change the pipes for the plumbing, but maybe every 50 years or something. But I, my wife, I should say, paints every couple of years. So the, I think the more integral you become to the infrastructure, the slower moving people are going to be. Not to say that Confluent's going to do things slowly, but you're right. It's just not a thing that people are talking about replacing. I also think that's partly due to Confluent getting some aspect of pricing right. Like, I don't even know what you guys charge for your cloud service, but I've never had anyone come to me and say Confluent's too expensive. But I have had people come to me and say this or that are too expensive. It's never been Confluent. Now you at Confluent would probably have a better idea, but I think I think that the team is doing a pretty good job finding that right price performance. Yeah, I mean, honestly, credit to MongoDB. One of the things when we started our cloud journey as a fully managed product, which is really all we're about now, that's that's yeah. where all the growth is. We actually did take a look at how MongoDB was, you know, rolling out Atlas and the customers, what they liked about it, the pricing models. And we got some great PMs in from, from other companies that had been doing this for a while. So yeah, I, I agree. We have a pricing's never is typically not an issue. In fact, it's yeah. funny. I just saw a, a communication from Jay. Now we have this new guarantee. If you can prove to us that you can, you have a lower TCO from managing your own Kafka. We're going to give you a hundred dollar gift card or make a contribution to a charity. Like pricing's not, I mean, we're, you know, the TCO thing pricing, we rarely ever get pushed back on us being too expensive. I, it, yeah. once they start using it, the $65 million data dog bill, did you see that? Man, those guys, <laughs> there's certain companies like, man, I just, well, the other one is. Salesforce that I always marvel about their, their business model, because like, I, and I've had conversations like, and I'm not saying anything pejorative about, but imagine trying to get off of Salesforce. Oh, how could you like even you do think, it? You think Oracle was locking, trying to move off Salesforce, Salesforce, if you're a large company, impossible. I've never even heard of anybody trying to do it. Exactly. Like, I, people try to get off Oracle as much as they can, right? <laughs> never even heard it brought up. We need to get off Salesforce. Never, not even once. 
So I've actually heard the opposite where companies try HubSpot and then they move away to Salesforce because they outstrip the features that HubSpot can deliver. Now we're using HubSpot at my startup. I love HubSpot. It's really simple, but I do wonder like, will it scale with the company only because I've seen that, right? Their feature set is fine for now. It's the but integrations it is, of Salesforce. That's, that's what yeah, does. Yeah, that's, that's right. Well, and you, and eventually you, you end up hiring, you know, VPs from other companies who just come in and like, no, we're moving to Salesforce. That's what I know. I've used it at the last five places. There's a tipping point where the, the software you built is less important than the platform you built for other people to build on top of. And they hit that a long time ago. That's when I talked to, so I was on a panel with the CEO from HashiCorp, whose name is eluding me, Dave. Dave McJanet. Yeah. Great guy. And that was kind of his, because one of the things we were talking about at the time is how viable is open source business models now, right? Because I've worked for a couple of open source, few open source companies now. And I'm like, things are changing because people want managed services. But I think what was successful for HashiCorp that he was pointing out was the fact that they, their, their integration model was built around open source, that there was a trust factor. And so the ecosystem of people that are supporting HashiCorp, particularly like Terraform, for instance, is, is huge. Every vendor now has their own Terraform provider like us. So yeah, the integration, integration is absolutely critical in the ecosystem. Yep. And I don't think there's any reason to keep that closed source or proprietary. I can't think of a reason why that's a good idea nowadays. Well, if you're okay with it, maybe we can talk a little bit about your journey to today and how you've come to be field CTO. Like I know you had a stop at McDonald's, which I can't wait to talk about oh, a yeah. little bit. Head fry chef. You don't meet one of those every day, but like, you gotta have good fries. <laughs> you have to have good fries and they need to be hot. Dang it. So we'll just like real quickly, how did you get into it and, and what was your initial draw and why have you stayed? What keeps you in this industry? Well, I mean, my, for me, like probably you guys, it started with some, well, my father brought home a, 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 an Osborne luggable from work. This was 1981 or something like that. The orange screen or green screen. Yeah, yeah, it has a little teeny green screen, like seven inch. And that's what started my love with computers. And I was like looking through the manual and doing stupid programs that were meaningless. And then I started doing text, choose your own ventures and programming in basic. Anyway, so. I don't know that just, I loved it. I loved building things and I loved computers. And back then it really, yeah, it really was not cool. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't even, it wasn't even a profitable like career direction either. Right. So coding was my thing. I love that. I, to this day, it is one of the things that brings me the most pleasure It's just right before I was talking to you, I'm, I have an open source project that I'm working on. And I was working on that. What, what are you working on? I have a open source stream processor that what it does is it takes, it uses something called Sigma, which is an open format for, for threat detection, cyber threat detections that you can publish. So the community says, okay, here's, here's a pattern that is a threat. If I see this HTTP and the URL is longer than this, and I see it more than five times in a 10 second window. That's not technology specific. And a lot of people use it with Elastic, for instance. They'll take this, they turn it into a query. What I've done is I've created a project with my colleague where you load all, you have a real time stream of Sigma rules. For instance, if there's a hack and someone publishes a pattern that in real time can go into Confluent, we're streaming that into a stream processor and the data into a stream processor. And then we're looking for these patterns in the streams in real time before it ever hits a SIM. So, Will, you, you did a stint at SPSS for four and a half years, and on your LinkedIn, it said that you were doing statistics and predictive analytics, and that caught my eye because obviously we're in the age of kind of LLMs right now, and predictions is everything. So I'm just curious, what was it like back then to work in predictive analytics? What kind of problems were you trying to solve, and how did the technology help or hinder you? Yeah, well, so back in those days, they weren't really using any sort of machine learning models, trained models. It was, well, of course I was at SPSS. It was statistical models for how you m make predictions based upon the, the data. I mean, that sounds pretty obvious. Yeah. Yeah. Was it all in spreadsheets? No, no, it, it wasn't. I mean, so if you don't know, a lot of people don't know SPSS anymore, but it's similar to like SAS. So actually. SPSS at the time was the oldest incorporated software company 
And so they were, they were directly competitor to SaaS. They got acquired by IBM in the end. What I specialized there was the visualization side of that, the statistics. So it definitely wasn't cool or hip. And actually I was, I remember pushing back. I was like, I don't know about calling it predictive analytics, a bunch of bullshit to me, but I was like, this is just statistics, man. That's why I'm not in marketing, right? <laughs> That's fair. So you went from there to Mark Logic. And I'm assuming that Mark logic caught your eye because it, it was, it is, and maybe, or was, and maybe it still is a really cool data technology. What attracted you there? And what did you, what did you take away from that experience at Mark logic? That was really when I went full fledged into the, the data side. I mean, it was working using data clearly in all my other jobs, traditional databases, et cetera. The thing that was eye opening for Mark logic, and this was prior to MongoDB or really any of the what you would call the no, modern NoSQL databases. So I, I didn't know H table. There was no Cassandra. There's no MongoDB or couch. I just could not believe how easy it was to solve certain problems, which was a freaking nightmare with a relational database. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is my first experience with a document model and just the ability to have a essentially, I don't know, a topic. I can't even remember what they called in Mark logic yeah. now. But where effectively you can have data that didn't all have the exact same schema, but maybe had some common characteristics. It was just so powerful. The equivalent and, of a collection in MongoDB. A yeah, table like a collection yeah. in MongoDB. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's that's what got me. That that shift was, and as we know, we've we've seen what Mark Logic did right was amazing technology. It was yeah. really good. But what they did wrong was the business model. I remember talking because this was right when Mongo was starting to get like first came onto the scene, they were still 10 gen. And I was like, guys, if we don't change our business model, we're going to be toast. And we're like, no, they like, they were like, let's look at what Oracle did and let's recreate it. We can be the next Oracle. I was like, there won't be a next Oracle. So technology, great business model, bad. And that's really when I switched to Mongo, I was like, I don't know, maybe employee 60 or something there because it was so easy to use for the developers. And the, I thought the model was right. And the Mongo COO was X mark logic and brought a bunch of people over. That's true. That didn't hurt. Yeah. I, I learned a lot from folks that worked at Mark logic. Like it was really interesting talking to people like Dave and others that came from that company and went to Mongo and the reasons they said they went to Mongo, they're, you know, similar to what you said. So, well, Mongo was just easier. And we talk about Mark logic having great technology and it was, but it was not developer friendly per se, right? You're writing XPath queries and all this nightmare stuff to interface with it. And she said, Mongo just made it way easier. You know, working with JSON is a lot easier than working with these crazy XML. And queries. in the language you want, like that yeah, was the key. Exactly. If you want Python, you want Ruby, you want Java, whatever, almost like you wasn't even using a database. That's what made it so amazing. I remember writing XPath queries in the early 2000s thinking, this is so stupid. Why is this a thing? But I didn't know enough back then to say anything. I just did it. And I was like, why are we building this website this way? Yeah, no, that was a, that was a thing. Like let's have our raw content in XML because then we can use XSLT to turn it into, it could be HTML, but listen, I'm going to defend XPath and XQuery's honor here. I agree. That was a barrier to adopting Mark logic. So that was bad, yeah. right? For sure. From a business perspective, but for some things, XQuery and XPath was amazing. So for, for some things like I literally one flower statement, I could search a database, find all instances that had a set of these four criteria and then turn it into something else. It was pretty powerful. So, yeah, but that's like saying a regular expression is really powerful, but also you don't want to try to write them or read anybody else's. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Fair that's point. Funny. All right. So will after Mark logic before Mongo, you had a gig where you did fries at McDonald's as the head fry chef. <laughs> What was as, that? As much as I'd love to have an amazing story about my head fry chef story, my experience at, at McDonald's, actually, it just, I just made it up. I thought it would be funny. So, <laughs> so it was a bad break between. Yeah. yeah, basically, because everyone at Mark Logic knew I was leaving. Like, where are you going? I said, I'm going to McDonald's. So I put it on my LinkedIn. And the funny thing about it, though, is I got more. This is maybe a sad indictment of my quality, but I got more endorsements on LinkedIn from from a fictitious job I never had than any of my other employments. So, you know what I've been getting a <laughs> lot lately, so sad. I lately, the last few months I've been getting tons of LinkedIn job offers to become, to go be a host at a restaurant. And I think it's because I have it listed that I'm a host on this podcast and they just look for the word host on LinkedIn. 
And they're yeah. like, Would you, you know, Red Lobster needs a host in, you know, Secaucus, New Jersey. And dozens of host <laughs> restaurant host jobs coming my yeah. way. <laughs> Maybe it's a backup career. I don't know. I mean, Chad, you are the host with the most. So, like, they're they're not wrong. And when AI takes all our jobs, I'm going to go work at the Red Lobster in Secaucus. I got it so lined up. Dude. I'm kind of disappointed that I haven't got any job offers from Burger King. <laughs> Seriously. Now that you tell me That's about funny. this. Wendy's doesn't know how to poach. No pun yeah. intended. <laughs> all right. So you went for, went to Mongo. I think, I don't know that we need to spend too much time on the Mongo experience just because it's so ubiquitous now. And then you went to Red Hat. Like, what was that that career change, or not career change, but what was that job change about? What what pulled you into Red Hat? Well, I, I, we were talking before we started. It was a hard decision because actually I was talking to Elastic, which I was yeah. pretty pretty hot on. Actually, I was talking to you, yeah. and I really liked Elastic. And uh, but I had I had I had friends at Red Hat that you know they they made me an offer I couldn't refuse, and I I did the culture. At Red Hat, and just in terms of the 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 open source culture, which which I'd sort of gotten exposed to really at MongoDB. Prior to that, Mark Logic wasn't open source. Yeah. So I I I came over to start up their their cloud, start start taking their cloud offering to market, which at the time was OpenStack virtualization. It was pretty poor to be honest. But the thing. The thing they got right was OpenShift. So that also excited me because at the time that like Google had just open sourced the Borg or not the Borg, it's, it's Kubernetes, right? Which was based off of the Borg. And so that was the other thing that was exciting to me from a, from a technology perspective. So lots of great people. It was a good opportunity. I had lots of fun, made lots of money, so I can't complain, yeah. but I, I realized then that's when I realized that really for me, it had to be about the data. So that's, yeah. that's why I left. I saw a Shesh just got made CPA is chief product officer for Red Hat. He was the guy who really pushed OpenShift to Kubernetes, which was really what saved Red Hat's bacon, to be honest, because they were becoming completely irrelevant at that point. So yeah, I mean, we had Brian Stevens on here last year. And we, we talked about that move in particular because originally OpenShift was, you know, we acquired Makara and it was this platform as a service thing. It had nothing to do with containers or, or anything like that, right? It was literally just a, well, I have this Java war file. I need someone to run it. And then they totally rebranded it and made it this completely other thing, which was, you said, truly brilliant and made Red Hat the $40 billion company that it was. Still make a lot of money on rel though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I don't understand that though. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to piece it together, but they do. I mean, I've seen, well, it's kind of what I was saying earlier, right? The more, I guess the further down in the stack you are and the better you work, the, the less desire there is to change. So like, do you ever hear anyone complaining about rel? I, I don't. Not complaining about rel, but we, I mean, I definitely see a lot of people moving to Amazon Linux or, you know, something that doesn't have a licensing fee. Well, here's the other thing. Honestly, people are moving to no operating system, right? Right. Now yeah, it's about exactly. server. Kubernetes is the new operating system. You know? and like, well, and, or, and at Confluent, we would argue like even that is a layer below what people care about. People just from, from, from our perspective, like, okay, all I wanted to be able to do is produce data and consume data. I don't care about Kubernetes. I don't care about like... That's what our customers care about. Like it's our job to figure that out. Now, there's still plenty of on-prem customers that's not the case, but that's the way it's going, right? So, Well, Will, I've read a few things lately that make me feel serverless is kind of going through that trough of disillusionment because some people have been very vocal about how expensive it is. And it seems like it's still finding its spot in the modern architecture and the modern workflow of a developer. Years ago, I was talking to a company out east and they had, when serverless first came out, they had built a bunch of services on serverless and they're like, let's take one of our primary ones and move it over. And it cost them three times, no, it was more than that. It was seven times more to run that same service as a serverless microservice or a serverless service than a microservice or something on a container, right? And so that was a eye opener for me because I hadn't done anything with serverless yet. Just was aware of it. If you have constant traffic, then it is cheaper to run it <clears throat> on something that's provisioned, right? It's only when you have big spikes up and down that serverless is economically viable. Yeah. So remember, I think the thing that's changed is in those days, Steve, when people said 
those days. I'm making it sound like it was like <laughs> a, a century ago. Yeah. When people talk serverless, they were really talking about how do I run code in a serverless way? So using Lambda, for, for instance, or or Azure Functions or whatever. Now, I think serverless is being applied to all levels of, of the stack. So for us, what serverless means is when you provision, and same thing for Mongo, right? If, if you provision Confluent, you're not saying, I want these three servers and I want my cluster to be this side. You don't do that. What I say is I need this amount of throughput and this amount of storage because I want to retain data. The servers are irrelevant to you. Then it just comes down to whether or not you have the right economic model. I, I, will, I will say very quite confidently that it's more cost effective just from, from how, how much faster you can be to market operational cost TCO. So, but you're right. I, I do know people, at least from executing code, like you and Chad are saying, it, it can be like, if, if you have predictable workloads, it's, yeah. it's much cheaper just to run your, you know, your microservice, however. So. Well, what was the, what was the topic at the beginning you said you wanted to hit on? Oh, data mesh. Yeah, let's talk about that. What, well, tell people what it means, actually. Let's start there. I'll start off. I'll give my, my preface when I talk about data mesh because I think most... Uh, so I'm, I'm a cynic by nature. And like, so whenever I hear a new term come out, I immediately don't like it. Even Like, I don't even get a chance. I'm like, it sounds a bunch of BS to me, and especially <laughs> if it comes from an analyst. Like, oh, Gartner said that. And I think it sounds like they just made that up. No disrespect to Gartner people out there. Plenty of smart Gartner people. But anyway, so I'm just sort of cynical. And so I kind of blew it off when I first had it, heard it. But when I actually started digging into it, especially because, you know, people had been banding around the term data fabric for a while, which was really, it's, it's sort of a conceptual marketing term. So I looked at data mesh, which sounded like more of the same, but actually, so what data mesh is, it is, it's a concept that was published by Zamak Dagani when she was at ThoughtWorks. And ThoughtWorks, actually, I do greatly respect a lot of the stuff they put out there because it's very detailed. It goes into the technical aspects. They draw upon specific numbers, a lot of case studies and customers they work with. And effectively, what they did was they said, let's look at the organizations and the architectures that have been the most successful in terms of taking data and treating it as a competitive advantage or a strategic asset. So reusing the data and increasing accessibility. So if you hear this term data democratization, that's kind of what it's about. It's like, okay, I have a product. How do people find it and use it? And they came up with four very concrete principles, domain oriented ownership of the data, data as a product. So that's product thinking, self-service and federated data governance. And then they, you know, Zamok detailed that in, in a couple of papers. One of the things I really about it is that actually it, it just so happens that those principles align super well with what I also believed, what I had seen from our customers that had been most successful, not just our customers, but in general, in terms of untapping the value of, of data. And it's not just technical. The biggest problem it's solving is not technical. It's technology is actually kind of easy compared to organizations, right? It's the social organizational aspect that's, that it addresses, which is really key in terms of, that's one of the things, that's sort of one of the barriers I think to that's holding companies back where you have these data silos. So like, okay, how do I expose that data? Well, there's a whole lot of reasons why that data is not being exposed. So. So yeah, that's, that's data mesh. And, and you, um, think the, what the, you think those reasons are social? When I say social, it's a, it's social organizational. Like, let me give you an example. Most of the, most of the valuable data is an artifact of some system that was built and the data spaces and the data is architect and in design to fulfill that one application. Right. And of course. So if I'm a team building my new e-commerce site, my job is to produce an e-commerce site that does what I'm supposed to do. My job is not to figure out how to liberate the data so that eight other people downstream can consume it. That's not typically how it's been. And so there's not a lot of thought put into how do I make this data consumable by people outside of my domain? And so one of the challenges there, it is an organizational thing. So because if they're not getting paid to do that, what's their incentive? One of the things when I talk to customers and they're looking at starting to do data as a product and data mesh, I say, okay, 
you have to figure out, A, you have to figure out what data products are going to have the most internal consumers, customers. So you figure out what to priorities, but B, you have to figure out how to enable those teams that own the data to produce data products. Because right now they're not incentivized. And one of the novel things I, I heard from one company that's pretty successful, they're literally what they're doing. I wish I could name them, but they are, if you are a data product producer, you get actually a cut of the profits of anything that's using your data directly as a developer. This is sort of similar to the people where they say, if you are looking for fraud, you get a cut of the fraud that you found or waste and abuse, that principle, and now it's with the data. So now they produce their data and a downstream consumer uses it to launch a new product, right? Any profit that comes from them, they get some, they can get some slice. And let me tell you, that did incentivize people to work longer hours and figure out ways to expose their data in a way that people can use it. Because the other problem is you can't with 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 data with the data product, you can't just expose your database and say, okay, here's my data. No one understands the schema. You can't have them impacting your operational system. You can't have them tied to your schema. Like if I change one of my tables, I can't break the 10 downstream consumers. But that's one of the problems we have nowadays because data flow, people have ETL jobs and they got like 10 ETL jobs for all the different systems. And you make one, one, one change to the source system and it breaks everything. So if I'm running a product and my product, I'm going to say my team inside my company has some data. You're saying this company would incentivize people to expose that data externally to other companies, and if no, those no, internally pay, to, oh, within internally. the company. All right, so they they expose it internally within the company, and they get a bonus based on whether other people are using it. Yeah, and and tied to the profits that the company makes from it. Oh, okay. So if the company makes profits using your data set, then you get a piece of the piece of the action. Yeah. Wow. That's a inter that is a really interesting idea. Have you all talked internally about the possibility of creating kind of a marketplace for this where companies would want to publish their data publicly and charge for it? AWS has a data marketplace. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so short sure answer is, yeah, actually we just launched something called stream sharing. The idea is if I'm companies, I'm using Confluent Cloud, I can say, Hey, I want to share this stream with someone else. And one of the things that we're planning on doing is creating a marketplace. So now I can start. NASDAQ's a great example. I had one of them on one of our, our tours and I was interviewing them for the audience. And that's effectively what they're doing. They have market data and the way they expose this real-time stream of market data is directly through Confluent or Kafka. So like if I'm a bank and I want to use it for my hedge fund calculations or whatever, and I need it in real time, I subscribe to the stream of data coming out of NASDAQ. But they're just one, like to your point, they're just one of many. I do want to be clear, like this data as a product, it's not just about company to company data products. It's about treating your data within a company as a product for yeah, other product. internal customers. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, let's talk about field CTO and the rise of this role to start. I mean, I think it's partially in response to the fact that as companies grow, you only have one CTO and there's only so many customers that they can talk to, right? And so there's a, there's a skill ability, but we still have customers that want to talk to technical executives that understand what the roadmap is, can talk about the vision and talk about what other customers are doing. Yeah. And you really want the CTO more focused on building product as much as possible. I mean, obviously yeah. they should be talking with customers, but it probably shouldn't be the bulk of their job. Yeah, well, it's interesting you say that because, so I, I totally agree with you. For a long time, actually, Confluent didn't even have a CTO. For the last four years, we had no CTO, or maybe three years. A Jay, who was our CEO, was very, he was an engineer at LinkedIn, so he was kind of the CTO, even though he didn't have that name. And so that made it doubly kind of important that we had field CTOs, and we got three at Confluence. Myself, Kai, who was pretty well-known, and then Chris Matta. Elastic too, because the CTO became the CEO and he never replaced that role. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Well, he, he now took that role again. I think so. he went back. Oh, did he boomeranged. Right? Yeah. He boomeranged. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. So, so that's touch part of my, and I agree with you, Chad. That's like, that's the other thing. So we, now we do have a CTO just announced maybe last month and he is, he's focused on the product direction and engineering. 
Now, I think most field CTOs, you guys tell me if I'm wrong, across the companies, they report up on the business, the customer facing side, the field. That's why they're called field CTOs. I actually, there is some discussion of whether or not it makes sense to actually align the field CTOs to have a dotted line to the engineering organization or not. So that's sort of an ongoing thing that I think it's worth companies look at because you do want to be talking to the customers all the time. You do want to be aligned with the people that are trying to make your customer success. So like we have this customer success, but at the same time, I think it's really important to have that conduit into engineering because it's a, it's a bi-directional conversation you have with your customers, right? Which is, you know, okay, this is great, but you need to do X, Y, Z with the product. We had, we had Brent Holden on here in an early episode. He was the field CTO at HashiCorp at the time. He's not there anymore. He's moved on to solo, but his big thing when he took that job was he didn't want the role reporting up through the sales organization. Cause then it just becomes a little bit pigeonholed as you know, maybe like an Uber SA or something like that, where as really, you know, sales is just one part of the field, right? You also have post sales delivery, consulting, training, customer success, all these other aspects of being in the field that maybe aren't part of the sales organization. And you really need to kind of oversee and be involved in all of that, as well as the engineering and product building side. Well, and I think the other thing about the role is that everyone's kind of defining it a little bit differently. And sometimes field CTOs have more responsibility than just field CTO, right? When I was at Elastic, I was field CTO, but I also ran sales enablement. And that was, I've heard other field CTOs running community teams or things like that. So I think that's still working itself out. I know when I worked at VMware, there was the office of the CTO, which was basically field CTOs. And I think they were kind of leading, leading edge there. And they all reported into I believe they all reported into the CTO at the time. It was the office of the CTO. Yeah, that's a pretty organized way to do it. But the, and we actually have an office of the CTO as well. But I do, I do think it's really, really important that field CTOs don't spend all their time navel gazing. That's that's my one concern about the office of CTO. Sometimes they become a little bit more in inward looking. Like, I think our job should be talking to customers all the time, hearing what they have to say and working with them to make sure they're accessible and make the right decisions. Staying abreast of industry trends, being able to connect dots and see patterns where others don't before others do and help guide things. I think that's kind of the role. I also see the rise of field CTO as inevitable because our peers at the companies we would sell to, the rise of the technical, technical executive has been happening for the last 20 years, right? When, when I first got into IT, the head of technology at one of the companies I worked for was a marketing guy. Like this doesn't make any sense, Wow! <laughs> but there weren't enough, there weren't enough technical executives at the time. Right. So I think as generational shift has happened and, you know, we started our careers 20 plus years ago, 25, 30 years ago. Now, you know, we're now in the space, we're leading teams, building companies. We are the tech executives and people want to talk to their peers because they want to share ideas and have a thought partner, you know, and if you assign me as a CTO at a company or a leader of engineering to an SE that's been in the industry for five years, we're probably not going to have a lot to talk about outside of just getting the work done that needs to get done. And if you want to build a relationship and it becomes field, more tactical, you've got to have more to, yeah, it's more tactical. You have to have more to add more value to bring. That's at least what I've seen. And the relationships I've built on the vendor side, it's been exactly that. It's the people that I would have been, had I not gone onto the vendor side and become a sales engineer. No, I think that's a great observation for sure. There's just, a, there's, there's more of a need for that bridging at that level that just didn't even exist right yeah. back back in those times so well do you think that technology sales will be influenced by the trends we're seeing now like i know that a lot of people are talking about ai replacing sdrs for example like oh i can just do my research and outreach emails with an ai i don't need this big team and I, i'm just wondering what your thoughts are on how that's going to change things for us as technology folks i think it will i i think even if you take even if you take a machine learning generative AI, the, the better chatbots, and they are pretty impressive out. I think there was already a trend. We have companies talk about being product led, which is you have salespeople, you need them for your most important enterprise accounts, but you really want to have a product that sells itself and you want to funnel people to using the product. And that changes the way in which you sell. Like that's, that's our belief. We want to have the best product we can. We want the product to sell because people want to use it. Right. Not because I have a guy who has a Rolodex and, and knows people. So, I, but I do think, yeah, you're right. I think that will, 
like there's that trend so because that's part of the self-service trend people just find it and use it but i agree actually that that's a good point i think some of the generative ai it's going to touch every every aspect yeah. to be honest yeah i see that the the whole product led idea i think some people can get hyper focused on just that as a potential go to market but i think that's not it's doing it a disservice product led is kind of a natural evolution of the information asymmetry that's been shifting, right? Back in the early 2000s, I didn't have access to all the data I have access to now. I couldn't really do a lot of my own research on products because open source products weren't necessarily as popular. Cloud wasn't a thing. And every vendor you went to to buy something was behind a schedule a call or schedule a demo button. And now when I see that, I'm like, I'm not going to do that. I have 20 minutes right now. Show me what the product can do in a video. I don't want to talk to anybody. I just want to do my research. And that to me is part of the reason product led is working or has to become a thing for most companies is because of that. Like if I don't have to talk to a sales rep and schedule a call to find out something that I could find out in 20 minutes by watching a video, I'm not going to do it. Well, I think the other nice thing is that that's why now you're starting to see all these customer success organizations like that was another term that didn't really exist. It makes perfect sense, but it, it's really, what is the role of the sales and the essays and stuff in the field? Now it's like, okay, they can get to the product themselves. How do we actually, our job is to make sure that they use it successfully, because if they don't, they, they won't, they'll stop. Right. That's so. right. That's right. And I think applying the sense of urgency, I think this is where I see sales teams focus shifting is if I go do my own research and then I start using your thing because it is product led and I can just start using it. If I don't have someone kind of talking to me and pushing me to use more of it and I expand my thinking and sign an SLA and the importance of that, developers can just stay relegated to the free tier for a long, long time. And I think, you know, at least at the companies I've worked at, there's this, there's these triggers where it's like, okay, this self-serve user is probably ready for a sales conversation based on the growth or the time or a combination of those things. And that's unless, where I see unless like, you f unless you follow Rasmus's approach of not having a free tier. Yeah, that's that's also a thing, right? If it's cheap enough, then you know, you don't need to make it free, but that's where I see sales reps spending more time and also just someone's got to manage the process. I tell you, having been at Empathic now for as long as I have, which is not that long, I have a lot more empathy for what sales reps enterprise sales reps go through. So it's changing my perspective on where enterprise sales reps fit in, in the modern sales ecosystem. But I still have some strongly held beliefs about how this should change and what it needs to look, depending on the product you're selling. Cause again, technical people, they don't want to talk to sales reps and there's a lot of salespeople out there that are great. There's a lot that aren't so great. And if I need to talk to someone about the tech, I don't want to have to go through the ceremony of convincing you that I'm serious enough to get a technical person on the call. Just give me to the technical person. The other thing too is the data for the usage is actually instrumental in understanding how to help the customer. That's we right. can see how people are using the cluster. They aren't doing stream processing. They are, they aren't doing this or aren't they doing that. And we're like, well, this is a missed opportunity for you. So yeah, telemetry data is so important yeah. and also messaging it in a way that's not creepy. Like, Hey, you know, <laughs> yeah. somebody's watching you. <laughs> That's also a trick. All right, well, to close us out, Will, I wanted to ask you a question that's not related to a lot about what we talked about, but it's a kind of higher level question. There's a lot of new people entering IT all the time. I'm just curious from your perspective, what lessons do you think we're doing great at passing down to the next generation? And what are maybe an idea or two of what lessons you think we could be doing better passing down to that next generation? That's a tough question, actually. You can tell I don't yeah. spend enough time mentoring people. <laughs> But you've talked to a lot of customers. I'm sure they're not all equal in terms of capability and tenure. I mean, this is going to sound corny, but, but I, but this is something I do tell people the younger, I said, honestly, I still believe that it's about the people and the relationships you build and trust and credibility. That's paramount. Just it, it's from a career perspective, even in whatever your current job is, it's important. A customer, if they don't trust you, they're not going to listen to you. They're not going to want to buy from you. They're not going to follow your advice. Yeah. But, but from a career's perspective, you don't realize this now, but the connections that you're making within your company, with partners and with customers has just a incredible impact on your career long-term. So like, don't, 
don't unnecessarily burn bridges. Yeah. Try to understand people's motivations. Try to help them build, build. Yeah, I think empathy is important. Understand where they're coming from. No one's, most people are in their jobs. They're not, they're not there to do a bad job. They don't, they're not intentionally being mean. They're just, everyone's doing the best. So I, I really do think focusing on the people and making those connections and understanding them personally is, is pays huge dividends that you can't necessarily see when you're joining, but you, all of us here know based upon our careers, just imagine how different it would have been with the different network. Yeah. yeah one of my mentors told me once that my network is my future. And I was like, oh, that's a really good way to put it. I didn't appreciate it at the time, but I do now. Every single job I've ever had was because of, you know, a referral from someone I worked yeah. with before, except for one, only one job in my entire career was a headhunter and it was a mistake. And I left in under a year, <laughs> every, you know? Yeah. I think my first, maybe one or two jobs were recruiters and cold intros, but that's it. I mean, but even aside from jobs, when you go to your next company, if, if you, if there was a customer, this is a pet peeve of mine, if there's a customer and you said, listen, Confluent is not a good fit for this. Do not use us for this. Like I remember doing this once at MongoDB with the customer and said, honestly, you're making a mistake. Like it does not make sense to use us for this. And let me tell you something that makes a big difference because when you come back and, and there are a VP someplace in five years or 10 years yeah. and you're working on another, they will remember that, right? I like your philosophy of helping other people. I think that's where people really remember. It's like that person helped me do something. So, you know, there is sort of a karmic aspect to it a little bit. Is there anything you think that we are learning from the next generation that's coming in? People that have grown up using iPads grown up using iPhones, like, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. That's just look at all my gray hair. I, I will say one thing <laughs> kind of related to the next generation that I do think it gets back to generative AI. I actually am kind of excited to see like, cause there's a certain kind of person that gravitated towards programming and building applications into technical aspects. And there's some people like my son, I thought was going to be like me and just hates programming, which I'm like, I don't understand it. How could you hate programming? It's the greatest yeah. thing. But like, so once the barrier and, and I hadn't really considered your point, Steve, earlier about the other implications, but once the demands and the way you go about building these new experiences has been changed. I am excited to see what the younger generation, new creative personalities will go straight from idea to an application. Whereas before they wouldn't be able to do it. It would be too hard. That's right. right. So I think that's could be pretty exciting. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, I think ignorance can be bliss in some of these cases where like we have all these anchors weighing us down. It's like, you might have a great idea or great inspiration, but you're like, oh, well, five years from now, it's going to fail because of this or that. It's like, or it's, you know, so hard to implement because of all these things we'd have to monitor it, et cetera. It's like, let's just, let's get out yeah, of that. Like, exactly. Yeah. So I, I agree with you completely. I think there's going to be a lot of new stuff that comes that we didn't think of. And it's like, oh yeah, I'm, they're not weighed down by all of our technical debt, so to speak, or whatever. Straight from idea to, to some sort of creation of something just opening the aperture of the people that can participate. It's the same argument for increasing gender diversity and diversity in the workforce because they yeah. bring other, uh, this is going to help that same, same sort of thing. Well, it's great to have you on the podcast. Thank you for joining. My pleasure. It's always nice to talk about the new roles that are coming up and how different companies are doing it. Cause it is a little bit different everywhere. So that was, yeah. that was a fun little thread that we had in that, in that episode. Thank you. See you at the next software company, guys. <laughs> Too funny. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. everybody. Thanks for listening. Adios.